Boy, that's a good song. Amen. We declare God's blessing and favor. We declare God's healing and restoration. We declare God's wisdom and direction. We declare God's goodness, grace, and mercy. And we declare God's power over every adversary in his church in Jesus' name. Give him praise and thanksgiving for this truth. You may be seated. We are in 2 Samuel chapter 3 tonight. 2 Samuel chapter 3. I guess if you wanted a title, I could title this message tonight. And just put this, this would be the title. Let God take care of it. Amen. Just let God take care of it. You'll get that as we go through this. 2 Samuel chapter 3, we'll read verses 1 through verse 5. That was the beginning of a long war. What was the beginning? When uh, Abner, if you remember last week, Abner was the captain of Ishbosheth's uh, army, the army of Israel, and now David is now ruling his one tribe of Judah in Hebron for seven and a half years, and Ishbosheth has been anointed per se, not anointed, but appointed rather without the anointing, appointed by Abner to be the king of the other 11 tribes. And so uh, when they were going to parlay, I guess you'd say, when they were kind of play fighting, they wound up 24 of them dead, and then there was a war broke out, and we know that, uh, I can't remember the boy's name, uh, Ashel, Ashel, went after Abner, and then we find Abner saying, leave me alone, I don't want to hurt you, and he kept going after Abner until Abner finally killed him, and of course, Ashel had two brothers, which were Joab and Abishai, and Joab was the captain of David's army. Or the general, however you want to say it. I hope that makes sense. I'm trying to lay down a little fr a framework in case you don't know where we're at tonight. And so when he killed uh, Ashiel, he broke out a great problem. Because Joab and Abishai wanted vengeance. They wanted payback because their brother was now dead. And so here begins what is called a long war. And when it says long war, it really is about two years, but I guess it's just continual war. They didn't let go of it. They just hung on to it. That was the beginning of a long war between those who had been loyal to Saul and those who were loyal to David. As time passed, David became stronger and stronger while Saul's dynasty became weaker and weaker, verse 2, these were the sons who were born to David in Hebron. The oldest was Amnon, the, whose mother was Ahinoam of Jezreel. The second was Kelab, whose mother was Abigail, the widow of Nabal from Carmel. The third was Absalom, whose mother was Micah, the daughter of Talmah, king of Geshur. Now we know that's an alliance with a foreign king. The fourth was Adinijah, whose mother was Higgith. The fifth was whoever that is, whose mother was Abtal. The sixth was that person whose mother was David's wife, Eglah. These sons were all born to David in Hebron. And David came with two, and then he got a whole lot more. Now, David broke the will of God when he did this, but he did it. And he caused himself a lot of problems. One of the things about David's life was he had a lot of family problems all the days of his life. Amen? And so then began a long war, and that was a state of hostility for really two years before David takes over with clashes ongoing. David was biding or biding his time knowing that God would keep his promise and give him the throne of Israel in God's good time. Waiting on the Lord might be the hardest thing we do. But that's when we have faith. Ishbosheth, who was one and the only one of Saul's sons who was still alive, 
was now on the throne of the 11 tribes. Ishbosheth was placed there by Abner because Abner wanted to keep his political power. And so he wasn't put there by the anointing of the preacher, but rather by the general of Saul's army. And Saul, of course, was related to uh, Abner, and Abner and Saul were related to each other. So Abner's trying to keep his hold on power. But the Bible says they were getting weaker and weaker. Abner was using his position in the house of Saul to strengthen his own authority, for he was getting ready to make David an offer the king couldn't resist. And I would add, he was getting ready to take over the throne. And you'll see some proof of that here in just a moment. I believe by the time it came time to take over the throne, he didn't want the throne because the kingdom was so weak. He didn't want it anymore. That's just my opinion. As for David, his family was increasing. I guess the Bible shows us how David is flourishing and growing, per se. David's son Solomon would go far beyond what his father had done that we read in breaking the will of God. We know that from Deuteronomy where God told the kings, do not multiply wives unto yourselves because it's going to cause you problems. And it will, and it did. David had moved to Hebron with two wives, and now he got six more. He got six different sons by six different wives. And when you got that much going on, you're going to have family strife. And uh, polygamy was forbidden to the kings of Israel in Deuteronomy 17 and verse 17. And so David is not doing what he should be doing, but God has placed him on the throne at this time. Everyone that God puts in charge is not always doing everything exactly the way they should be doing it. But be careful you don't dethrone them if God put them there. You wait on the Lord. Remember, let God handle it. God will handle it. He's got his way of taking care of things. I think I heard tonight, I think I heard before I came out here, Brother, Brother Adam just said the wrath of man does not... I can't remember the rest of the verse. The wrath of man does not bring the righteousness of God. When we act on things, we almost always make it worse. But God sees the whole picture. He knows when the right time is to act. And David had family trouble. Amnon, David's firstborn, would rape his half-sister Tamar in 2 Samuel 13. And then be murdered by Tamar's full brother Absalom, who would be killed while trying to take the kingdom from his father David. He had trouble after trouble. And these are the ones listed. I would dare say he probably had a lot more than this because there was a lot of um, strife and jousting for position probably among those boys for who's going to get the throne. We know there was because when it came time to get it, it was some of them fighting each other over it. No doubt David's marriage to Micah was politically motivated so that David would have an ally near Ishbosheth. During David's final illness, Adonijah, one of his sons, tried to capture the throne and he would be executed by Solomon at this time. So there was all kinds of problems that came from David breaking the plan of God in his life. Let's go on to verse 6 through verse 11 of 2 Samuel chapter 3. As the war went on, Abner became a powerful leader among those who were loyal to Saul. Now notice Abner's becoming powerful, but Ishbosheth becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. Go ahead, verse 7. One day Ishbosheth, the king, Saul's son, accused Abner of sleeping with one of his father's concubines, a woman named Rizpah. Abner became furious. Am I a Judean dog to be kicked around like this? He shouted, after all, I have done for you and your father by not betraying you to David. Is this my reward that you find fault with me about this woman? Verse 9, may God deal harshly with me if I don't help David get all that the Lord. Now, this is important. This is important. Abner said the Lord has promised David the throne. Now, Abner's been fighting against what God wanted. He admitted it right here. All the Lord has promised him. Keep going, verse 10. 
I should just go ahead and give David the rest of Saul's kingdom. I should set him up as king over Israel as well as Judah from Dan to Beersheba. That's from the north to the south. Ishbosheth didn't dare say another word because he was afraid of what Abner might do. Ishbosheth was a weak person. Now Saul died on the battlefield with three of his boys, but Ishbosheth wasn't there probably because he was too weak to really fight, and he wasn't out there fighting like he should have been. Abner was a pragmatic politician as well as a shrewd general. And his basic principle was always join the winning side. I guess you'd say, like most politicians, take a poll. <laughs> what do the people want? But I've learned a little bit about politicians in my short life. They'll tell you what you want to hear, and they'll give you a little bit, but they're going to be taking a whole lot. All right. Every time they give you five dollars, they're taxing you a hundred. And they're gonna give you just enough to get you to be quiet. That's just my political opinion, but uh, Abner was a pragmatic pragmatic politician as well as a shrewd general. His basic instinct was always join the winning side. And when he realized Ishbosheth's side was losing, he said, I'm fixing to go join up with David. When he perceived that the throne of Ishbosheth, as the Bible says, was getting weaker and weaker and had no real future, he decided to switch loyalties and thereby guarantee his own security, hopefully. And David had a reputation for kindness. He never wanted to cause problems. Uh, we aren't told for sure what Abner did or didn't do when it came to this concubine risp, and he denied it. But did he or not? We don't know. He committed, a, if he did, he committed a very serious offense in a kingdom. For a deceased king's harem or concubines belonged to the successor. In this case, Ishbosheth would be the one who would take over that role. Any man who even asked for one of those women was asking for the kingdom and thereby guilty of treason. And this is what led to the death of Adonijah. When Solomon killed him, you go to 1 Kings very quickly. 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 13. I want you to see this. 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 13. So you'll get this picture with me. One day Adonijah, whose mother was Higgeth, came to see Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the wife of Solomon. Solomon, I'm sorry, the mother of Solomon. Solomon's mother. Have you come to make trouble, she asked him. No, he said, I come in peace, Adonijah said. In fact, I have a favor to ask of you. What is it, Bathsheba said. He replied, as you know, the kingdom was mine. Everyone expected me to be their next king. But the tables were turned and everything went to my brother, Solomon, instead. For that is the way the Lord wanted it. Well, if that's the way the Lord wanted it, go home and be quiet. So now I have just one favor to ask of you. Please don't turn me down. What is it, she asked. He replied, speak to the king Solomon on my behalf, for I know he will do anything you request. Ask him to give me Abishag, the girl from Shunem, as my wife. All right, Bassie replied. Apparently she didn't realize what he was doing. I will speak to the king for you. So Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to on Adonijah's behalf. The king rose from his throne to meet her, his mother, and he bowed down before her. When he sat down on his throne again, he ordered that the throne be brought, uh, be brought for his, a throne be brought for his mother that she might sit at his right hand. I have one small request to make of you, she said. I hope you won't turn me down. What is it, my mother? He asked. You know, I won't refuse you. Then let your brother Adonijah marry Abishag, the girl from Shunem, she replied. And look what Solomon says. How can you possibly ask me to give Abishag to Adonijah, Solomon demanded. You might as well be asking me to give him the kingdom. You know that he is my older brother and that he has Abathar the priest and Joab the son of Zeruah on his side. Then King Solomon swore solemnly before the Lord, May God strike me dead if Adonijah has not sealed his fate with this request. Where are we at? 
verse, go to verse 25. The Lord has confirmed me and placed me on the throne of my father David. He has established my dynasty as he promised. So as surely as the Lord lives, Adonijah will die this very day. So King Solomon ordered that guy from that place to execute him. And Adonijah was put to death. Why? Because he asked for a concubine from his father's harem. And that was the same as asking for the kingdom, which is treason. And so did Solomon deny his mother? Not really. He put Adonijah to death, so there wasn't no need to give him anybody. He said, I'll take care of this. And so he put him to death that very day for asking it. So we know that when Ishbosheth accused Abner of this, he was saying, you're trying to take the kingdom. And I personally believe he probably was. But he called his hand, and then Abner changed his loyalties. It's possible Abner did just that with Rizpah. The king wasn't strong enough to oppose Abner, who now announced that he was on David's side. Abner put him up, remember? Abner put Ishbosheth up, and if man puts you up, man can take you down. And so Abner really took Abisheth Ab down from that throne. Abner negotiates with David uh, for a diplomacy per se. Let's go to verse 12 through verse 21. Then Abner sent messengers to David saying, let's make an agreement and I will help turn the entire nation of Israel over to you. All right, David replied, but I will not negotiate with you unless you bring back my wife, Micah, Saul's daughter, when you come. David then sent this message to Abisheth, Saul's son. Give me back my wife, Micah, for I bought her with the lives of 100 Philistines. That's what Saul required, and he did it. So Ishbosheth took Micah away from her husband, Palta, son of Laash, Paul to follow along behind her as far as Bahram, weeping as he went. Then Abner told him, go back home. So Paul to returned. Meanwhile, Abner had consulted with the leaders of Israel for some time now. He told them, you have wanted to make David your king. Now is the time. For the Lord has said, I have chosen David to save my people from the Philistines and from all their other enemies. Abner also spoke with the leaders of the tribe of Benjamin. That was the tribe that Saul was from. Then he went to Hebron to tell David that all the people of Israel and Benjamin, because Benjamin was a tribe of Saul, so that would be significant. And Benjamin now supported him. Verse 20, when Abner came to Hebron with his 20 men, David entertained them with a great feast. Finally, verse 21 then Abner said to David, let me go and call all the people of Israel to your side. They will make a covenant with you to make you their king. Then you will be able to rule over everything your heart desires. So David sent Abner safely. Everybody say safely. safely. David sent Abner safely on his way. Now this was a dream come true for David. No bloodshed. He's going to get to take over the whole kingdom without a war and that's exactly what David was hoping for that somehow some way it would work out where no one would die and this would all just happen and Abner could be the key and so David talks with him and communes with him and tries to set this up and they negotiate together this is what you'd call ancient shuttle diplomacy Abner sent messengers to David offering to bring all Israel under his rule and David sent messengers to Abner accepting his offer providing Abner first Send Micah, his wife, to him. She was David's wife, and she was Ishbosheth's sister. Abner told Ishbosheth to honor David's request, and David also sent Ishbosheth a message asking him to send Micah. Abner conferred with the elders. There's a whole lot of messengers involved in this before it comes together. Abner conferred with the elders of Israel. Abner conferred with the leaders of Benjamin. Abner and 20 representatives from the tribes came to Hebron, bringing Micah with them. And Abner and David agreed on how to transfer the kingdom into David's hands. And there they shared a feast and made a covenant. In the early stages of this diplomacy, or this negotiations, 
It might have been dangerous and unwise for David and Abner, Abner to meet personally. The Bible says they were at war. So they depended on their officials to make their necessary contacts. I wonder how much of that goes on today. I, I'd be surprised if what we hear on the news is just a small amount of what's really going on between governments. Outright war was the only alternative for taking over the whole kingdom. And David was hoping against this. He was a man of peace among his brethren. He had wanted, he had waited for seven, over seven years to take over all the tribes. Why did David make Micah return? Why did he make that a condition for the negotiations? First of all, she was still his wife, even though Saul had given her to another man. It was good diplomacy to invite his queen, Micah, to join with him. And in fact, then when she came home, some of Saul's house now was on the throne, strengthening the hand of David and possibly bringing some unity together. By claiming the daughter of Saul, David was also claiming all the kingdom. And when Abner brought Micah to Hebron, it was a public announcement that he had broken ties with Saul's house and was now allied with David. Let's read on verse 22 through verse 25. But just after Abner left, Joab and some of David's troops returned from a raid. Remember who Joab is? He's the captain of David's army. They're coming back from a raid and they return as Abner's leaving and they brought much plunder with them. Keep going for me for the food. Verse 25. Then Joab was told that Abner had just been there visiting the king and had been sent away in safety. He rushed to see the king. What have you done? He demanded. What do you mean by letting Abner get away? You know perfectly well that he came to spy on you and is here to discover everything you are doing. He's inferring he's going to make a secret attack probably. And so Joab is upset because Abner came in and went out in safety. And Joab has a brother that Abner killed in a battle, and he wants vengeance. When Joab heard that David was had received Abner and given him a feast, his anger erupted and he rebuked the king. The man who killed young Ashiel had come and gone in peace. Joab didn't have any faith in what Abner said or did, and Joab was certain that Abner was doing nothing but spying on the kingdom in hopes of attacking and the text records no reply from David at this time. We don't see anything he said from David. Joab had never been easy to deal with. You'll see that in a few verses. David says this. And the fact that he was a relative of David made the situation even more difficult. How many of y'all know relatives are harder to deal with than everybody else? Everybody else, you can tell them to put their canoe in some other creek. But when it's your relatives, they're going to come back around Thanksgiving to Christmas. To your creek. They want to fish your pond. Eat your turkey. The dynamics of David's family were complex. And David didn't help none either. And he, it created a lot of problems. David's silence wasn't that of agreement, however, because he didn't agree with his general. It was the silence of restraint and the evidence of a deep desire to put the nation back together without bloodshed. But Joab went out and did something without David knowing. Verse 26 and 27, Joab then left David and sent messengers to catch up with Abner. They found him at the pool of that place and brought him back with them. But David knew nothing about this. And when Abner arrived at Hebron, Joab took him aside at the gateway as if to speak with him privately, secretly, in the shadows. But then he drew his dagger and killed Abner in revenge for killing his brother Ashiel. Joab accused Abner of being a liar to David. But then Joab himself practiced deception on Abner. How many of you know that if you've ever been hurt by somebody, stop and think, you've hurt somebody. We've all been on both sides of that. 
Joab must have sent the messengers in the name of the king, or Abner would have probably been more cautious. But apparently he dropped his guard, for he was a man of war, only to be executed by Joab in a secret place. Joab and his brother Abishai were waiting for Abner, took him to a secluded part of the city, and stabbed him under the fifth rib, of the same place he had stabbed their brother Ashiel. Everything about the death of Abner was wrong. The two brothers knew what the king wanted, yet they deliberately put their own interest ahead of that of the kingdom. David wanted a united kingdom without bloodshed, and they went ahead anyway. Ashiel had been pursuing Abner. You've got to understand. You say, well, he's going to get away with it. Nobody gets away with anything that is put in God's hands. Say, well, if I don't take care of this, they're going to get away with it. Put it in God's hands. He can handle it. If you handle it, it'll probably be worse. Ashiel had been pursuing. Remember, Ashiel, their brother, had been pursuing Abner on the battlefield. Trying to kill Abner when he was killed. So he was a casualty of war. But the death of Abner was murder in the shadows. Hebron, where they were, was a city of refuge, a sanctuary where an accused murderer could get a fair trial. But the two brothers never gave the elders in Hebron a chance to hear the case of Abner. Abner killed Ashiel in self-defense. He told him, quit chasing me. I don't want to do this. But he wouldn't stop, so finally Abner killed him. But when Joab and Abishai killed Abner, it was pure revenge. There was no self-defense. Ashiel's death occurred in broad daylight on the battlefield where everybody could witness what happened. But Abner's death, it happened in the shadows. Anything you got to do in the shadows probably shouldn't be done. Abishai had accompanied David into Saul's camp and he had seen David refuse to lay his hand on Saul or Saul's warriors in vengeance. He left that in God's hand. So he knew David would not agree with this. And David did not agree with it. Verse 28 through 39 now, when David heard about it, he declared, I vow by the Lord that I and my people are innocent of this crime against Abner. Joab and his family are the guilty ones. May his family in every generation be cursed with a man who has open swords or leprosy or who walks on crutches or who dies by the sword or who begs for food. So Joab and his brother Abishai killed Abner because Abner had killed their brother Ashiel at the battle of Gibeon. Then David said to Joab and all those who were with him, tear your clothes and put on sackcloth. Go into deep mourning for Abner. Notice who he's saying this to. David told Joab to do this. He said, you and your brother and all your warriors, start a funeral and join in. And King David himself walked behind the procession to the grave. Verse 32, they buried Abner in Hebron, and the king and all his people wept at the graveside. I think David must have understood, if we don't do this, we're going to have war with the other side continually. I need to let the other side know I had nothing to do with this. This was not my desire. Then the king sang this funeral song for Abner. Should Abner have died as fools die? Your hands were not bound. Your feet were not chained. No, you were murdered, the victim of a wicked plot. All the people wept again for Abner. Verse 35, David had refused to eat anything the day of the funeral, and now everyone begged him to eat. But David had made a vow saying, May God kill me if I eat anything before sundown. This pleased the people very much. In fact, everything the king did pleased them. So everyone in Judah and Israel knew that David was not responsible for Abner's death. Now, what the Bible never says and what I think is true is they weren't sure who was responsible. For David not only gave a funeral for Abner, but he never outed the guilty parties. He kept them covered too. 
The king, then King David said to the people, Do you not realize what a great leader and a great man has fallen today in Israel? Verse 39, And even though I am the anointed king, these two sons of Zeruiah, Joab, and Bishai are too strong for me to control. Those two there. Now, I believe this was a secret meeting, and you'll see why in a moment. They're too strong for me to control. So may the Lord repay these wicked men for their wicked deeds. Had it been a public thing, they would have probably been brought, brought to trial, but there never was a trial for what they did. When David heard the news of Abner's death, he immediately just declared he had nothing to do with what his two nephews had done. He went so far as to call a curse down on their house, the house of Joab. And then David issued a royal edict that the commander Joab and his army mourn over Abner and attend the funeral. David commanded them all to tear their garments, put on sackcloth, and weep over the death of this great man, which in my mind infers Everybody didn't know what was going on, and they were putting on a show so the, the, that there wouldn't be continual war between the two nations. Because Joab and Abishai were among the official mourners, it is likely that many of the people didn't know that they were the murderers, and David didn't call them to trial. And it's likely that he his statement in verse 29 that we read in verse 39 was spoken privately to an inner council. And David wrote an official eulogy in honor of Abner and he made it clear that Abner was a great man and he had fallen before wicked men who had deceived him. David had experienced God's gentleness in his own life and he tried to deal with others as God dealt with him. He no doubt went too far many times with his own family but he tried to do the right thing. All David could do was leave judgment with the Lord for he never makes a mistake. But Joab and his brother didn't leave judgment with the Lord. I bet the Lord could have took care of Abner if they'd have just waited for the Lord to take care of Abner. But they didn't. Let's go to chapter 4. Let me read this chapter for you. <clears throat> kind of capitalizes on what we saw before. When a bishop Abisheth heard about Abner's death. Now he's the king of Israel, the other 11 tribes. When he heard the captain of his army, Abner's death at Hebron, he lost all courage and his people were paralyzed with fear. You know why? They think David's coming to take over. They think David now is going to take them by force. Now there were two brothers at this time. Bani and Rechab, who were captains of Abisheth's raiding parties. They were sons. See, they were under Abner at one time, and they were sons of Remen, a member of the tribe of Benjamin who lived in Baroth. The town of Baroth is now part of Benjamin's territory because the original people of Baroth fled to Gittim. There were still where they still live as foreigners. Keep on going through verse 12, verse 4. Saul's son, Jonathan, had a son named Mephibosheth, who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when Saul and Jonathan were killed at the Battle of Jezreel. When news of the battle reached the capital, the child's nurse grabbed him and fled, but she fell and dropped him as she was running, and he became crippled as a result. One day, Rechab and Benai, these two guys, the sons of Ramon from Baroth, went to Ishbosheth, that's a king's home, around noon as he was taking a nap. The doorkeeper who had been, had been sifting wheat became drowsy and fell asleep. So Rechab and Benai slipped past the doorkeeper, went into the king's bedroom and stabbed him in the stomach. Then they escaped. Notice they did it privately, secretly. But before leaving, they cut off his head, and he lay there on his bed. Taking his head with them, they fled across the Jordan Valley through the night. They arrived at Hebron and presented uh, Ishbosheth's head to David. Boy, they didn't know David very well, did they? David's already killed folks for this stuff. And here they come with the head of one of Saul's family. <laughs> 
They presented it. Ishbosheth's head to David. Look, they exclaimed, here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of your enemy, Saul. Now, Saul was uh, the enemy of David, but David was not the enemy of Saul. The head of your, the son, the son of your enemy, Saul, who tried to kill you. Today, the Lord has given you revenge on Saul and his entire family. When it comes time for God to give you vengeance, He's probably not going to do it through your brothers. He's got a lot of other ways of handling things. But usually it's not brother killing brother. But David said to Rechab and Benai, as surely as the Lord lives, the one who saves me from my enemies, I will tell you the truth. Once before someone told me Saul is dead. Thinking he was bringing me good news, but I seized him and killed him at Ziklag. That's the reward I gave him for his news. Now what reward should I give the wicked men who have killed an innocent man in his own house and on his own bed? Should I not also demand your very lives? Verse 12, so David ordered his young men to kill them, and they did, and cut off their hands and feet and hung their bodies beside the pool in Hebron. Then they took Ishbosheth's head and buried it in Ab- Abner's tomb in Hebron. Here we have another chapter where people took vengeance into their own hands. Time and again, they want to take vengeance. It's always going to not work out for you. Ishbosheth, if you remember, was a mere puppet that Abner had put on that throne. And his general Abner was really in charge. But now Abner is dead. And the people of the tribes of his kingdom knew that Abner's death meant the end of the reign of their king. And they no doubt expected a swift invasion by David and his army, but that was not coming. It was a day of distress for Ishbosheth and his people. But in that middle of all that, two guys, Benai and Rechab, these two men were minor officers in Abner's army who thought they could earn rewards and maybe even positions and promotions from David if they would kill Ishbosheth. And while the king was asleep and unprotected, they killed him. If the murder of Abner was a heinous crime, and it just happened, the murder, this murder was even worse. For this man's only crime was that he was the son of Saul. At least Abner had killed somebody's brother. But Ishbosheth had not. His crime was being the son of Saul. He had broken no law and injured no person, and he wasn't given the opportunity to defend himself. His murderers didn't even show respect to his dead body, for they beheaded him so they could take the evidence to David and receive a reward. And boy, did they get a reward. Even worse, the two murderers told David that the Lord had avenged him. And David didn't buy it. I think David realized when the Lord gets ready to avenge and take care of things in his house, it's not going to be brother against brother or sister against sister. And when Saul and Abner died, David made made it very clear that he was in no way involved in these activities. And it would have been very easy for David's enemies to start slanderous rumors that the king, David, had engineered the death of Saul and Abner and now Ishbosheth. And David wanted to make it very clear, I did not do this. I am not ca- trying to cause strife or division in the kingdom. I'm here to bring unity. And so it is in the kingdom of God. We should be here to bring unity one to another. And things are going to happen. We're going to hurt each other. We're going to cut each other. Every once in a while, we're not going to get along real well. But for goodness sake, let's don't kill each other. Because when that starts, it doesn't get better. It just gets worse and worse and worse. And David said, I had no part with this. I didn't engineer their deaths. I wasn't trying to force my way onto any throne. And this caused the people to accept David. At the king's command, his guards killed those two confessed murderers. 
cut off their hands and feet and hung their corpses as evidence of the king's justice. This was a humiliation to them. David didn't just kill them. He humiliated them for doing this heinous act for they had touched Ishbosheth and executed him privately. David had the head of Ishbosheth buried in Hebron in the sepulcher of Abner. Go to Romans 12, verse 14, very quickly, and we'll come to a close. Romans chapter 12, verse 14 through 21. If people persecute you because you are a Christian, don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. When others are happy, be happy with them. And if they are sad, share their sorrow. Live in harmony with each other. Don't try to act important, but enjoy the company of ordinary people. If you hang around me, you're going to have an ordinary person. <laughs> but enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Doing things in such a way, do, do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do your part to live in peace with everyone as much as possible. Don't stir the pot. If it's messed up, don't stir it. Well, I need to fix this. It may not be time to fix anything. Leave it alone. Verse 19, dear friends, never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God. For it is written, I will take vengeance. I will repay those who deserve it, says the Lord. Here's what the devil's going to tell you. They're getting away with this. They've hurt you and they're going to get away with it. They're not. Nobody's getting away with anything. Amen. God sees everything and I believe he takes care of everything. I do believe this is the exception clause, though. I believe that if you take God's job and you do his job, he's going to let you take care of it. But if you say, you know what? I'm going to be kind. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to do right when they've done wrong. God will take care of it. We're just not smart enough to take care of it. Instead, do what the scriptures say. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. If they, And they will be ashamed of what they have done to you. Finally, verse 21, don't let evil get the best of you, but conquer evil by doing good. 1 Thessalonians 4. Can I have one more? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 through 6. God wants you to be holy. You should keep clear of all sexual sin. Then each of you will control your body and live in holiness and honor. And watch this. Not in lustful passion as the pagans do in their ignorance of God's God and his ways. Verse 6. Never cheat a Christian brother in this matter by taking his wife. For the Lord avenges all such sins. When brother hurts brother, daddy gets involved. And we as brothers and sisters in Christ have to be extremely careful because we have one father that we don't hurt each other. We're going to hurt each other from, but let's be careful we don't go to war. Before you go to talk to somebody about how they, and you should go to people and talk to them if they've hurt your feelings. Come to me if they've hurt your feelings. You should go to them and talk to them. But before you go, you should pray until you love them. You may have to set some things straight, but make sure that they know you love them. You may have to say, now I'm not letting you do X anymore. You can't go here anymore. You can't do this for me anymore. Whatever it is, you may have to set some things in order. And that's okay. But for goodness sakes, make sure that they feel you love them. And you're not just out to beat them up. Well, they beat me up. Yeah, and God will take care of that. If we could ever realize, he said vengeance is mine. 
He didn't say they're going to get away with it. He said, I'll take care of it. I got it. Then we are free to not become bitter or angry or strifeful. Say, no, God's got it. I'm going to move forward. Let's stand. Just let God handle it.